Open your Bibles with me, if you would, please, uh, to Luke chapter 15. Uh, We're going to continue right where we left off last week, and we're not going to get nearly as far as you wish we would. Um, But uh, if you're able, please, would you rise for the reading of Scripture? Luke chapter 15. Uh, verses, uh, beginning at verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into that far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near, came and drew near the, to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered to his father, look, these many years I have served you. And I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost. And is found. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed Father, in these next few moments, May you take these humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your greatness. May you teach your people the message you would have them to hear. And above all things, Father, bring glory to your name. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Uh, This morning, we're continuing our series on the parables of Luke 15 by looking at the most famous of the three, the parable of the prodigal son. Has anyone ever heard the name Charles Dickens before? All right? See a plaster across our TV screen every Christmas. He wrote uh, the Christmas Carol. He wrote a lot of great things, but, but uh, the Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge is the thing that we remember him for. Has anyone ever heard the name Ralph Waldo Emerson before? Absolutely. Both of those men... Uh, giants in the field of English literature have said that this, the prodigal son, the story that we just read, is the greatest short story ever written. 
That's high praise indeed. But before we can continue, we have to ask, by show of hands, does anybody know what the word prodigal means? One. Excellent. That's one more than I expected. Because when I looked at it, when I was doing this, I thought, well, why haven't I ever looked that up before? I've been hearing that word my entire life. So I looked it up. It's just one of those words you've always heard. You always hear it in relation to the story. And so we just use it like a name. But Merriam-Webster defines it as characterized by profuse or wasteful expenditure, lavish, recklessly spendthrift, yielding abundantly or luxuriant, one who spends or gives lavishly and foolishly. There's also another definition in Merriam-Webster, which I think was probably created because of the word's close association with this story. And that definition is one who has returned after an absence. Since that definition has nothing to do with the previous definitions, I kind of think that that word just sort of grew into common usage from us telling the, the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus is telling the stories we learn in the first few chapters, or first two verses of the chapter, surrounded by four groups of people, by tax collectors and sinners, Pharisees and scribes. That is, he has people from every strata of Jewish life listening to him during this sermon. From the wealthy religious elite to the beggars of the street, Jesus is teaching all of them So he establishes a paradigm for his parable. That is a pattern. The pattern is someone loses something good. They search for it. They find it. Party. Like a lot of preachers, I try to do the alliteration thing. And I failed utterly here. I had lose, look, find, and Fiesta? I had to jump to another language to make it work. Lose, look, find, and party. Now, the first parable, the shepherd has 100 sheep. He loses one. He goes and searches for it. He finds it. He returns rejoicing. And then we have verse 7, which reads, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And in the second parable, we have a woman who has 10 coins. She loses one. She goes and searches for it. She finds it. She calls her friends, rejoicing. And then we have verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels over, of God over one sinner who repents. Now, lately, Certain political factions uh, in this country have been trying to use these parables to suggest that the one is more important than the remaining multitude. This is silly. The seeker searches for the lost one because it is lost, not because it is more valuable somehow than that which is not lost. The shepherd does not forever abandon the 99 sheep once the missing sheep is found, nor does the woman discard the remaining nine coins once the tenth is found Lost things are important because they are lost. Lost things have intrinsic value. And those things which are lost require our attention. Now, also last week, we took time to break down the meanings of the parables. Who is the shepherd who has the lost sheep? And what, does the sheep, what do the sheep represent? Given Jesus' culmination of the parables in verses 7 and 10... We can say that the the images of the shepherd and the woman represent Jesus himself, or perhaps simply God in the minds of the scribes and Pharisees. And the lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, are those sinners which have yet to come to repentance. Or maybe the Pharisees are thinking that the lost thing represents Judaism itself, and and those who are, I mean, the The shepherd and the woman represent Judaism itself, and and those who are lost are those who haven't come to synagogue lately or haven't been giving their tithe. No matter how they interpret this parable, the point is that they do interpret it. 
They, just as we, try to understand these parables by plugging in people we know or concepts with which we are familiar. And they're probably feeling pretty smug right now because it's easy to see others as being the lost. I'm good. I'm righteous. I mean, I go to, I go to church. I go to church every Sunday. I, I'm, I'm good, right? Let's look briefly again at verses 7 and 10 before we move on because they are integral to understand what's going on here. Verse 7, just so I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And verse 10, just so I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over the one sinner who repents. Every single time a sinner repents, dearly beloved, there is a party in heaven. Now, this is not like the pizza party that our dear beloved elementary school teachers throw for us from their own salary, God bless them, where we get half a slice of pizza and four ounces of Kool-Aid because that's all they can afford. I remember that and I loved those days anyway. No, no, this is a, a, a party. What kind of a party does God throw in heaven? Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 5 says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Our God shall rejoice over us as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. There are days in our lives that are so significant to us that we remember them forever. For example, everyone remembers their first day of school, right? It was a big sea of kids and a guy up there in a red shirt or something. It was a very long time ago. But we don't honor that date. I don't mark that date down on my calendar and every year when it comes around in August or September or celebrate, right? It's not, it's not a party that I remember. Similarly, many of us remember the day we graduated from high school or college, but we don't mark it on our calendar and celebrate it each year. But your wedding day is a day of celebration that you revisit every single year. We are expected, and rightly so, guys, to remember the day we joined with our spouse before God and men. It is a day worth honoring and a day worth remembering. And most of us celebrated that day with an extravagant party, bringing friends from far and near to witness the event and to eat and to dance with us. The joy of the bridegroom, Isaiah says, is the joy of heaven when one sinner repents. I went to OU. I've been to a lot of parties. I've been to a lot of parties, and, and some of the biggest, we would have the alumni come back from the marching band, and, and we would have, you know, we, I don't know why, but they would cook clams on a grill. Don't do that. That's nasty. But we did it anyway, and there were kegs of beer, and there was, a, there was this big pot of cider, and then there was a little pot of cider next to it for people like me. There was no vodka in this cider. I've been to a lot of parties at OU, but the biggest party I ever attended was on my wedding day. I had aunts and uncles come to Chillicothe. Where's Chillicothe? I don't know where Chillicothe, where, find it, get here, party. We had this cake that was huge. We fed 250 people in this big dining hall. We danced and we sang and we had this wonderful celebration because it was the joy of the bride and the bridegroom, dearly beloved, that is the kind of party heaven throws every single time a sinner repents. If you want to turn up the atmosphere in heaven, go talk to some people. Go tell people about this joy that you have found in Christ. Moving on. 
Note also that God does not wait to start the party at a thousand sinners. All right, when, when we get to a thousand, we'll have the party. I like to watch these debates, right, between you know, a Muslim and a Christian or a Christian and a Jew. I, I, like, I like religious debates. But there's always this caveat that's given at the beginning to hold your applause to the end, right? Because if you, if you applauded every time one of your debaters made a good point, the debate would never happen. It would just all be, uh, that's not the way God does it. God does not hold his applause for a thousand people to come. God does not hold his applause for a hundred people to come. God does not hold his applause for ten people to come. God throws a wedding party every single time a sinner repents. It's the biggest party most of us have ever seen in our whole lives. The biggest celebration, the highest joy. This is what heaven feels when one sinner repents. Now on to the parable. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, when I was a child, I was told that this was just something you could do. Is that in that culture, you could just go to your parents and ask for your inheritance, and they had to, by law, give it to you. I was told that by men who had no idea what they were talking about, but were just trying to make up a reason to excuse, explain something in the Scripture. What they did, by answering ignorantly, was to color this passage for me very differently than it should have been. Dearly beloved, that is not... The case. What happens here in verse 12 is far more scandalous than that. The land of the Middle East uh, operate on a what's called an honor shame paradigm. That is, they have a different outlook on life than we do. Whatever brings shame to the family is horrible. Whatever brings honor to the family is good. If you're a geek like me, you're familiar with the J Japanese samurai caste. The samurai carried two swords, a long one and a short one. The long sword was for combat, for self-defense, for conquering. The short sword, though, was always there. If the samurai did anything which brought shame to his lord, his family, or to himself, he would use the sword to commit ritual suicide. Honor among the samurai caste was so important that losing one's honor meant losing one's life. In the Middle East, it is similar even today. In his book, Seeking the Law, Finding Jesus, a book I absolutely commend to everyone, Nabil Qureshi tells the story of a young woman from a Muslim family who meets Jesus and becomes a Christian. Her older brother discovers this and locks her in her room for four hours while he goes to find their father. During those four hours, the young woman posts several times on an internet forum telling people what's going on. And at the end of those four hours, her father breaks down her door and kills her with his bare hands. In his mind, her abandonment of Islam brought such shame to the family that the only way to fix it was to kill her. Dearly beloved, don't dismiss the idea of the honor-shame paradigm. Honor in that culture is more important than one's own children. We cannot understand this parable unless we understand that. Now, a quick Google search of the phrase honor killings 2020 brought up 2.2 million search results. Even today in the Middle East, even today, the Middle East is a culture driven by the honor-shame paradigm. And in that culture, the honor of the family is more important than the lives of the family. 
I realize this is a big diversion from the text at this point, but this cultural context is essential for understanding what is about to take place. The honor of the family is everything. The one last caveat. I am absolutely not endorsing this kind of thinking, and the Bible isn't either. Please do not harm your children for doing something stupid. But this is the setting in which we hear the story. Now here, in verse 2, Jesus is inventing a character for his story. He's inventing a horrible, wretched sinner in the person of the younger son. And Jesus is really going over the top here. He's making this character as horrible as he can possibly be. Give me the portion of the inheritance that should fall to me. It's like saying, I wish you were dead. I care about nothing except the wealth your death will bring me. Now, we don't have an honor-shame culture here, but go and say that to one of your parents one of these days and see what happens. Don't. (laughs) Don't. But in this culture where honor killings happen, this is what this punk does. Your things are more important to me than you are. Your wealth is more important to me than our family name. Give me the portion of the inheritance that falls to me. The Pharisees and the scribes were sitting here and they immediately and rightly hate this younger son. What he's just asked for is preposterous and it brings great shame upon his family. But we see in verse 12 that the father does exactly that. He gives the younger son the portion of his inheritance that would fall to him. Now the Pharisees and the scribes are outraged. In their minds, the father should have stoned his son to death for asking such a thing. And yet he gives him the portion of his inheritance. Under the law of Moses, the father should have stoned his son to death for asking such a thing. And yet the father capitulates. Verse 13, not many days after the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Soon after receiving his inheritance, the younger son leaves. He packs all of his bags, loads his new camels with all the wealth that he has, and he goes to Las Vegas, Nevada, or to New York City, or some such place, somewhere where the booze is flowing and the women are for sale. And he lives this riotous life, spending extravagantly, on anything and everything he ever wanted. And being quite wealthy, he accumulates these fair-weather friends who are drawn to him because of his wealth, those looking to benefit from being so close to a prodigal person. But when the money dries up, so does everything else. The alcohol stops flowing, and the girls are no longer interested, and his friends say, I'll call you, and then never do. Verse 14, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. Even those things which he had saved, even those purchases he still had, he lost. In a famine like this, you have to buy food. You sell what you have. Eventually, you sell your home and your fine clothes. Your gold watch buys you a cheeseburger. Your fancy car buys you a few loaves of bread. And when those are eaten, dearly beloved, there is nothing left to sell. And here's how desperate this boy becomes. Verses 15 and 16, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. This good Jewish boy 
this good Jewish boy from Brooklyn is feeding pigs. This good Jewish boy from a noble house in Jerusalem had never wanted for anything in his whole life. And now he is feeding pigs. And he's not even being paid well enough to sustain himself because he was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs were eating. He is reduced in this honor-shame culture to being jealous of the pigs that he is feeding. And don't forget that pigs are filthy, unclean animals in Jewish culture. And here he is on the social rung looking up to the pigs who have enough to eat. Jesus has created this character who is so wretched that the scribes and the Pharisees sitting there have already written this boy off as worthless. Someone entirely beneath their notice. Someone who has brought shame and disgrace not only to himself, not only to his house, but to his entire religion and his people living among Gentiles because Jews don't raise pigs, starving to death and after having violated the law of God through licentious living and doing those things which God has commanded us not to do. This person is one of the most wretched sinners imaginable, and Jesus has created this character for that very purpose. Everything he has done to this point is reprehensible, and he has heaped ever-increasing shame upon his family. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have. <laughs> father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now, in American culture, you and I see this as what we'd, we would call a turning point. We see this son of the nobleman as realizing that he is the son of a nobleman. That he yet has a string to pull. But that's not what's going on here. By asking for his inheritance, the boy has declared his father dead to him. He is right when he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's the truest thing he has said this whole parable. Treat me as one of your hired servants, he says. And he arose. Sorry. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The phrase, and he arose, do not ever underestimate the power of rising. Do not ever underestimate the power of confession. Father, he says, I have sinned against heaven and before you. This wretched sinner, this horrible son, this one who has brought shame and disgrace upon his family and his father and his people and his religion, he arose. He got up. And he came to his father. Now, dearly beloved, I realize that there are another 12 verses in this parable. And I'm well aware of how long we have all been sitting here at this point. So I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll close with this verse and we'll resume next week. He arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. I love this. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. How? Isn't his father working in the fields? Isn't his father inside his office doing paperwork? No, dearly beloved. His father was standing on the pinnacle of the house, looking. 
Well, how did he know that his son was going to come back this day? He didn't. The son has been gone for an exceedingly long time, possibly years. And in this honor-shame culture, the father who had been so horribly shamed by his son, this father who had been insulted and humiliated by his son, this father who had, been, who had lost his standing among the people, who had lost his position among the elders, who had to endure the whispers in the marketplace about how horrible a, such a father he must be to have produced such a horrible son. This father was watching. He was waiting for his son to return, not because of shame, not because of revenge, but because he was his son. The father sees the son a long way off and his heart breaks. Dearly beloved, Middle Eastern noblemen do not run. They glide with an air of dignity. Their robes fall to their ankles and they do not run They do not kick up dust. They do not raise a stir. This nobleman grabs his robes and lifts them and runs barelegged through the streets of the city to get to his son. Why? Because he's his son. The people seeing this nobleman running with his legs bared heap increasing shame on him. They're scandalized. They open their eyes and their mouths wide in surprise that a nobleman could be so undignified and run. And dearly beloved, do you remember the story we told a few weeks ago about Naaman and Elisha? Where Naaman comes to Elisha's house and he's already insulted because the prophet didn't come out to meet him. Naaman, the second most important person in the country, expected the prophet to come out and meet him a long way off. Dearly beloved, that is exactly what the father does in this story. The father is watching and waiting for the son to return. And when the son comes, the father sees him yet a long way off. And he hikes up his robes and he runs through the streets, ignoring the shame, ignoring the humiliation, ignoring the insults. And he grabs a hold of his son and he falls on him and he wraps his arms around him and he kisses him. And the son begins his speech. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And the father interrupts him. (laughs) Forget it. Forget it. Bring... Bring a gold ring and put it on his finger. Bring my robe. Bring my best robe. Slaughter the fatty calf. We're going to celebrate because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Can you imagine the mouths of the Pharisees? Can you imagine the horror they felt at this? Because what is this? This father who has every legal right to stone his son to death under the law of Moses is embracing him and treating him like a king. This is called grace. You remember the the joy of the one sinner who repents, this is that part of the story. This is that part of the parable. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The Pharisees don't have a category for the concept of grace unmerited favor. They don't understand. They don't have anywhere to to put these things. And so they are scandalized all the more. They are outraged at what Jesus is saying. They are outraged at the characters in the story, both the son and the father. But we, 
understand. And you know who else understands? The tax collectors and the sinners who are sitting there next to him. Those who don't deserve forgiveness. Those who don't deserve mercy. Those who don't deserve to be treated like this. You and me. We understand. That's where we're going to stop this morning. There's still a good bit of the parable yet to to go through. And it's a part of the parable that I have always, in my mind, thrown away. I just... This is the important stuff, right? The return of this, this son, I, I didn't care about the rest of it. It was, uh, why, did, why didn't Jesus stop talking there? But he is God, and he is wise, and he knows. So next week, we're going to continue from this point. I hope you'll join us. Let's bow our hearts.